modest fact that... You recall at our last meeting, we discussed the problem of integrated housing, and we found out that almost 1,700 Negroes are moving into Los Angeles a month. By 1970, there'll probably be a million Negroes in this city. And I know that people are concerned about this. They may not talk about it very often, but I certainly heard them shudder in church when he said there would be a million Negroes in Los Angeles. We shudder because we're saying, in essence, the majority of these people are not like we are. And uh, we felt that we, maybe some of us felt we left this out because we were getting away from this problem. We are a part of this exodus, too. But we are a little, maybe embarrassed by the fact that here we're going to have a, a mass element come in that, that's going to create a tremendous social problem in the community to which we find a uh, great deal of difficulty in relating to. Well, I want to sound like a do-gooder, <laughs> because I really am not, and I'm somewhat of a snob. But I do think that with these people coming in who are not our intellectual equals, nor are they of our soci sociological uh, bracket, uh, they're not to be a handicap to us. They'll find their own level. Now, I do sound like a snob, but I don't mean it this way. But they're used to living a certain way, and they, too, might uh, rise, up, uh, rise up above their origin and might one day be our associates. The whole tone of this meeting is uh, we're setting ourselves up as little puppet Jesuses. We can't help anyone else until we help ourselves. The Negro has had two professions, his own medicine, dentistry, uh, law, or psychiatry, and he's had the profession of being a Negro. And many of us have come out here to escape from this second profession of being a Negro. And we are out here a while, and we're working in our own field, and then we find out that here these same problems are falling on the heels of 1,600 Negroes a month that come into Los Angeles. Now, this gives us problems. It's our own view, it's our own identifying with these Negroes that are coming in with their carpet bags that causes us problems. This is our basic embarrassment that we as Negroes have. We want to live together, yet we want to sort of scatter to the far winds and live amongst uh, white people. We, we, we are brought up in terms of this, that to have a dark skin, to, have, uh, to be a Negro, there is something wrong with it. And if you take a child and raise him, a, a, a child, a very impressionable child, and have him grow up in an atmosphere where your color of skin is something that is looked down upon, that there is something wrong with you, that you are, 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 are not, you, you don't have the abilities of other people. Even no matter how much education, no matter how much uh, training, et cetera, you have, a lot of these impressions stay with you. I feel that we have to search for a new image. When I wake up in the morning, I don't look in the mirror and say, you are a Negro, therefore you will face life in a certain way. I see myself as a person, just like all the people that I work with and the children that I deal with, and they're all people. I've got to break in here. Yeah. This, I've I, I tolerated it long. This idea of this consciousness, of you've got to look in the mirror to face yourself to, to go through this bit about being a Negro, is very naive. The uh, individual, this concept was instilled in you before you could think. Right. Oh, I don't agree you see. With you. And first of all, we have, as a symbol in our community, the white, straight hair, brown hair, as the symbol of the things it's tried for. Now, there's nothing wrong with it, except that it represents the very fact that we are talking about. The idea, the Negro in our society is a rejected child. There's no two ways about it. It's in Los Angeles, it's in New York City, it's in any place in the United States. Good evening, all. That clip is a very powerful clip that was sent to me by my co-host and said, I found the clip. We're going to open the show with this clip. I found it. And he was right. Uh, that was the probably the best way to open up this show, considering uh, the guest that's with us tonight. So let me not waste any time. I know there's a lot of people here, and you guys know that I'm adhering to the hour time limit nowadays. My homie, my dog. Pascal Robert. Good evening, my brother Jason Miles. How are you living, brother? I'm doing good. How's everybody out there in Chatland? Uh, yes, Joshua Sanchez says Pascal got the goods. Pascal had the goods on that one. I think we might have used part of that before uh, a while back, 
But uh, for for who we have on to, tonight and and what we're going to be talking about, that is so perfect. Um, I do want to read a small excerpt from uh, our guest's book, uh, "Following the War: The Struggle Against a Communist Ideology." that endorsed uh, radical equality but restricted liberty presented democracy with a different challenge. In the fight against communism, democracy took on a different meaning for its American adherence by stressing its civil libertarian dimension. Gunnar, uh, is, it, is, it, is it Mirdal? Mirdal. Uh, Gunnar Mirdal's American Dilemma, uh, while researched and written in the context of the war against fascism, was also relevant in the Cold War, in uh, in either uh, in either context. Uh, Mirdal's thesis that there was a contradiction between the American creed of liberty and equality and White's practice of virulent racism racism besmirched American democracy. Black leaders. Uh, from at least the time of Frederick Douglass, have attempted to expose this contradiction as a way to shame whites into practicing their professed ideals and accepting African Americans as full citizens. Racial democracy has been the dominant ideology of black politics since World War II, but social democracy has also surfaced periodically. Unsurprisingly, the Depression era was a period in which social democracy as ideology and politics vied strongly with racial democracy in shaping black protests. Black leftist politics was often independent of the Communist Party, but critical of the New Deal as not radical enough. And that's I'm going to stop right there because it, it, I actually did highlight a little bit more. But I want to bring this brother in because I really enjoyed uh, whatever. I haven't finished the book, but what I've read so far, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed he is Preston H. Smith II. He's a professor of politics at Mount Holyoke College, and he's the author of Racial Democracy and the Black Metropolis, Housing Policy in Post-War Chicago. Please welcome <coughs> Professor Preston Smith II. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you for that generous uh, introduction. I'm excited to be here with you. We're, we're very, 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 very pleased to have you. Um, we've both been uh, tearing into to your work. Uh, Pascal, the moment we found out that you were going to be on the show, um, Pascal was like, man, I got to get this brother's book. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so Pascal and I talk on a daily basis and, uh, and pretty much every time he, he, would, he would read something, he'd be like, man. This Preston Smith book, man, we we got to get this brother on here and, and and interrogate this, in the great words of my brother Pascal Robert. So. Wow, well, I'm you looking forward add? to the conversation. Yeah. Oh well, we're you know Pascal wants to ask you some questions about uh, this concept of uh, social democracy and racial democracy. Pascal, well, you you, know. you can ask it better than me. Uh, you know, brother Preston. You know, there's so we can go in so many directions with your book, and I just want to make it clear that this is probably one of the best, if not the best, book I've read that exposes the internal conflict of class contradiction that exists amongst Black American Black Americans and how it affects policy, particularly in terms of housing during, during the Jim Crow era. Uh, I also believe, you know, I want to shout out you are a graduate of Howard University, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, you are a bison. Yeah, yeah, I want to let people know that Brother Preston, you know, has been writing about our community for quite a while. But we're going to get to the questions because time is of the essence and we're going to go straight to the questions. So I want to start. Your book explains how the focus on class based policy of the black leftists in the Depression era sometimes clashed with the race first inclinations of black civic elites. The main way you draw the distinction between the two distinguishing social, the two distinguishing factors is by social, by using the term social democracy, which is the preferred, was the preferred vehicle of the black leftists and racial democracy, which was the preferred vehicle of black elites. Can you explain the difference in these two outlooks? Uh, certainly. Um, I mean, first of all, I wanted to uh, think about uh, a framework uh, that got us outside of the usual binaries of integration versus separatism or protest versus accommodation. 
And so that's why um, thinking through, you know, I wanted to see, uh, was there an orientation um, around racial inequality and class inequality that inform the both the thinking and uh, the planning and the politics of you know the professional managerial class. Um, racial democracy is simply uh, this idea that um, you know uh, there should be a, a racial group access to all social goods, and that's measured proportionally, right? So basically, the idea that if there are ten percent of white folks who uh, have access to a, uh, a neighborhood or a job or uh, some, you know, healthcare, uh, quality healthcare, then there ought to be 10% black folks. Um, and so that's how it's measured. But the whole idea mainly is a non-discriminatory and equal access to social goods and largely uh, for qualified individuals. The idea of social democracy uh, really in contradistinction from, from racial democracy is this idea that basically you need uh, uh, a sort of broad access. You need uh, universal programs to um, deal with particular problems uh, or particular um, yeah, issues within society. So uh, let me just give you an example of how I think about this in terms of housing, which is what the book is focusing on. If you are taking a racial uh, democratic approach to housing, then your idea is that you should have, that black folks should have access to any housing that they can afford, right? No matter where it is, uh, where it's located, if they can afford it, like those good people in the, in the film, then they should have access to it, right? The idea of social democracy um, is that you should have the people, um, African-Americans and other Americans should have access to housing and adequate housing, whether they can afford it or not. So that's the big difference. Racial democracy is really about, you know, access uh, that does not at all uh, call uh, both uh, class hierarchy within the black community or in outside the black community into question. And social democracy takes class more seriously, uh, certainly tries to grapple with that hierarchy by making uh, and allowing broad access to social goods. And so that's, that's, that's the general idea and framework that, that, you know, sort of animates the book. Um, and that's, I think it's a framework that can be looked at beyond the housing field, which is, of course, what my book focuses on. And what's interesting about that is in your book, you very eloquently demonstrate that that Blacks, working class Blacks, particularly during the, Demo the, the, the Depression eras, were bumping heads with the Black professional managerial class in that time because they were demanding policy prescriptions that benefited them as working class people. And as we know today, the majority of black people are working class or working poor, yet we right. still today have a black elite, petite bourgeois managerial class that shapes the ideological infrastructure of today's politics and discourse. And what I love about your book, what makes it so important is that it is a reflection of contemporary black class politics without the existent black working class demand for social democracy. So you kind of give a very good historical snapshot to illustrate that though black politics is fluid and it changes, that it changes what we call the problem with the at Black Agenda Report or what's known as the black political class and the class stratification and how it affects black politics and policy is definitely not a post-civil rights phenomenon, but goes back into early in the 20th century. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, as I mentioned, and, and I think the the you know the excerpt that uh, that Jason read, you know, this idea particularly of of using democracy as a way to expose the contradictions, the supposed contradictions between a sort of liberal creed um, and racist behavior, it goes back Frederick Douglass perhaps before. Um, but what you mentioned in terms of the, the influence of a middle class or influence of a professional managerial class speaking for the race, that has been a feature of, of African-American life. Uh, again, from that same period, uh, you know, the classes have, have uh, or the characters have changed, but the, but the message has been basically the same, that we know best. 
Uh, and that's because, you know, the idea of their class interest has always been presented, either hidden or presented as being in the best interest of all black folks, right? In other words, if we get access to uh, housing or we get access to these jobs, if we get in the room, right? How many times have we heard this? If we get at the table and we, and we uh, get in the room, then that means we can open up doors for the rest of you. Well, you can't open up doors if there's only a limited number of people that can come in based on the constrictions of, 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 of principles of a capitalist political economy, which is basically, you know, what is profitable uh, and what is going to be allowed. So I think that, that you know, their notions uh, um, have are, are bankrupt at this moment. And we need to have other ways of thinking broader um, than the idea of basically uh, uh, racial group access. We need to think about who is winning and who is losing in that particular approach. And I try to demonstrate in the book that I think it's working class and poor blacks uh, in housing and in other areas who have been losing. I, I did want to ask this question real quick to kind of deviate from the, <laughs> the questions we have for the show. Mm. Uh, Pascal and I talked about this a little bit earlier this morning. I think it was, I can't remember which company it was that's dumping $10 billion with a B into uh, black women's uh, starting business yeah. for black women. Who was that, uh, Pascal? Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is giving uh, black women uh, $10 billion with a B uh to uh to help start some some businesses how do you feel about uh, that kind of uh politics where where private uh, industries come in and and just try to uh ignite some black capitalism <laughs> well I, I feel like i'm um you know deja vu all over again if we're you know thinking about the 1970s uh and and sort of the really big one at least um, more recent articulation of black capitalism under uh, Richard Nixon. Um, the idea again here, and we heard this throughout the campaign uh, amongst Democratic Party uh, aspirants, that you know we need to support black business, we need to have more black entrepreneurs, uh, and so yeah, this is another uh, you know another instance of you know if we're going to confront the sort of problem and the issues that uh, the majority of black people have, then the best way to do it is to seed black businesses or to integrate uh, corporate America. Um, you know, and again, the assumption with that is that that's going to trickle down, uh, you know, to brothers and sisters uh, uh, basically on the block. And, it, you know, and we know at least we've been through this before, but it is a story that we continually tell. Um, or this class continues to help because it allows them to continue to, to um, develop their, their uh, legitimacy, right? As leaders of the group and, uh, and leaders of, of the race. And I think that's something we have to call into question. Excellent. I have to do, I do have to ask a question uh, from, He's he's pretty much the 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 fifth beetle here. Uh, <laughs> Jean Bajlan has sent me a question um, that he wants to ask the professor. He says, um, uh, "Can you ask the professor if he thinks racial democracy is a dead end because it will result in a reaction from whites because it will mean less of a limited pie for white people?" That's from Professor yeah. Jean Bajlan at the yeah. University yeah. of uh, Missouri State. Um, so, you know, I think racial democracy is a dead end for, for other reasons. Um, you know, I'm not sure that, um, you know, the focus of this should be, um, you know, I, obviously when you're thinking about, um, you know, black political aspirations or aspirations of, you know, different black, uh, citizens, you have to think about what is going to be the reaction and relationship to other uh, Americans, other groups, because we're all part of the same uh, polity. Um, I think it's a dead end. Racial democracy is a dead end because um, it has limited impact. And I've been, you know, that's what I've been saying. Uh, it, it doesn't have um, the wherewithal to address really the basic uh, fundamental material needs 
of, of the majority of black people. Um, and I think the other thing is that the logic of racial democracy, which is to continually to uh, push for, um, you know, a sort of race targeted policies, right? Uh, and in this case, really targeted policies targeted towards African American, um, doesn't, um, doesn't allow for the kind of uh, political uh, power and political, um, um, uh, I guess, political emphasis that we need, right? I think we're talking, you know, if we're going to see uh, uh, access to uh, social goods, universal programs, we're going to need a much broader uh, uh, political base um, than just the Black community. And I think, uh, for me, racial democracy uh, and race first programs end up being a dead end uh, and don't get us there. I mean, it, couldn't we argue that one of the problems with the racial democracy or race first program is that it has not escaped the paradigm where you have race management under racial elite tutelage negotiating at, on the in, no, negotiating the interests of the majority of blacks and ending, ending up settling for class-based initiatives for their class and patronage, what I call fat back and biscuits that, you know, basically is able to, you know, keep them tied, i.e. to the centrist faction of the Democratic Party, i.e. corporate interests, and keeps them policy-wise tied to an agenda that does not address the needs of the, the majority of working class and poor Black people. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, uh, uh, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, no question that, that basically racial democracy allows for that sort of managing. And so what we've seen basically, particular in the neoliberal area, uh, where, where scarcity is permanent, right? Uh, is the idea that uh, there's, you know, certain population, working class population, um, largely, largely black and brown, uh, but white population as well, um, are in precarious situations. And, you know, they're in precarious situations in terms of their employment, low wage employment, their, their housing is unaffordable, they don't usually have access to quality uh, health care or quality education. So the, you know, so the way in which they deal with that uh, is a you know could be in fact um, through um, you know trying to supplement one's income through the illegal economy. Um, so so we have people in the managerial class basically trying to manage inequality, um, and that's what we have amongst the black professional managerial class: manage black uh, inequality or inequality that impacts uh, uh, the black community. And particularly, uh, sorry, uh, uh, working class, working class blacks. So absolutely, you know, it's 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 a dead end in terms of feeding that sort of brokerage model again. Uh, a group of people who have who many of of whom we have not voted for, but but who because of their um, educational credentials, their professional credentials, think they can speak for us, um, and 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 use. Um, really the misery, if you will, and the problems of our, our community, our, our, our population, um, to make claims uh, on uh, di different kinds of sinecures and different kinds of, of if you will, patronage uh, that ends up benefiting them, but doesn't necessarily, and as, as I said before, doesn't, uh, you know, seep down to, uh, to uh, you know, to the lower reaches of, of, the, of the black population. So absolutely, I think that, you know, it, it reinforces that managerial um, uh, focus. Uh, but again, it's also a dead end in terms of trying, you know, what, you know, what, what we want to think about is what's the best way of, of, of confronting the issues that we, uh, that we, that we're, we're dealing with, right? Uh, whether it's low wages or, uh, or inadequate health care. Uh, or unaffordable housing. Um, and that can't be done uh, in the context of a sort of, you know, isolated, fictive, if you will, Black community. That has to be done um, in, a, in a large sense, it has to be done, um, you know, with uh, people who are committed uh, to seeing broad access uh, to, uh, to public goods. Um, uh, and to basically to decommodify those goods to, to extent to make them available 
to as many people as possible. And many of those people uh, who are going to have access uh, are black and brown people. Excellent. I want to move on to the next question. Early on in your book, you illustrate how the notions of unified racial interest or collective black community often masked the class and political tension that existed among blacks in, Ch in Chicago and how presenting black unified racial cohesion is a black elite or black professional managerial class project. Can you explain the way the assumption of unified racial interests created obstacles to housing policy in Chicago that would have been more beneficial to poor and working class, class blacks. Do you see that as a problem that continues into the modern era? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, so what's interesting is that the clip that you show, you know, in the beginning of this program, um, you know, if you're in that class, you've heard, <laughs> you've heard those, those comments. But those comments are not widely known, you know, in terms of a, a certain kind of uh, a class bigotry. Um, and so I think there are moments when uh, uh, black middle class folks will focus on their class. And it's usually uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the moment when, in fact, they feel like they're not getting the same things that their white counterparts are getting, right? In other words, uh, black people are almost saying to themselves, we like, you know, class privilege too, or we, you know, we should have class privilege too. Uh, so you hear it in those particular moments, but for the most part, um, the, 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 the idiom or the, the language is a collective language, right? It's a language of we, uh, it's a language of us, this whole idea of linked faith, basically that, you know, that, that, what happens to me or what happens to you is going to impact on me. Um, in the past, and from that clip, they felt like what was going to happen to all those black migrants was going to negatively, negatively uh, impact them. Um, but this whole idea that we're linked together um, uh, through race and through racism and through racial discrimination uh, is something that has been a consistent message um, that, uh, that this particular class has used. Um, and what that does, when you put race out front all the time, um, you, you hide class and you hide class within the community, but you also hide class in the sense that of, of how to think about um, what's, the, what's the, the large impact on, uh, on the majority of, of working class people in this country, uh, which is you know, a political economy that puts corporations first, that puts uh, uh, the wealthy first, that will do everything, uh, but look at redistribution of goods and services. The kinds of contributions that people make and contribute uh, don't come back to them, um, right? They, they, you know, what we've been seeing is, in fact, tax cuts after tax cuts that, in fact, we're seeing upward redistribution, not redistribution uh, that would help the folks themselves. Uh, so, you know, so I think that that, um, you know, part of the of the of the program, but part of the plan has been basically uh, to continue to talk about race. Um, and it's not to say that you know racism needs to be talked about, right? But when it's talked about incessantly, and when it's talked about at the exclusion, right, of uh, class inequality and, and and class exploitation, that's when we have a problem, and that's when we can't see clearly what the, you know, how we're facing uh, the problems um, uh, that we're confronted with. Yeah, one of the examples you used in the book that I thought was very fascinating, which was kind of played on the concept of racial uplift, right? That working class black people needed middle class black people to show them how to be civilized. Because the belief was that since black people are collectively viewed as poor, having middle class black people be able to wear a suit and tie and speak proper English automatically was a demonstration of a challenge to the problems of the whole race. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, the, 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 the argument was that the more of us that are like us, like, you know, these, you know, the middle class, professional managerial class, then racism will disappear. And the problem is really that you working class and poor Negroes can't be more like us. So these kind of racial 
racial uplift tutelage programs became the norm of move, of organizations like the Urban League and even the NAACP. So can you talk about how that kind of racial uplift uh, paradigm of not giving actual policy, politics rooted in political economy, but using the model of like, be like us middle class Negroes and everything will be wonderful, was really kind of a bankrupt way to address not only housing, but black politics overall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, I think that uh, racial uplift has been with us for a long time um, in the politics uh, in black politics and particularly politics of uh, middle class blacks. And, um, you know, again, you know, what you saw in that clip was a lot of anxiety, right? A lot of anxiety about what was going to happen when all these Negroes, uh, all these black folks were going to come to the to Los Angeles, come to the city and begin uh, to, in a sense, create uh, what they thought, uh, you know, uh, racial, uh, racial conflict, right? Uh, and so the Urban League, which I've done my early work on, um, was designed, um, was in fact founded to basically manage that conflict. Uh, when uh, African-Americans, uh, Black Southerners were migrating to the North, um, and for the most part, for you know, for for the, for for labor to 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 work in defense industries, um, you know, the city fathers uh, were concerned about what's going to happen. First of all, they sort of thought maybe they would go back. I mean, which was foolish. Uh, but they but when they realized they weren't going anywhere, they needed to have you know basically social work professionals, black social work professionals, think about what are the ways in which we can sort of. Uh, of manage, <laughs> if you will, assimilation, uh, or manage, uh, or and and to minimize the conflict at the workplace, and particularly the conflict uh, also in, in the community. And of course, the big way in which they managed that was through segregation, right? Um, so, um, so we see this now. And in fact, the most recent example of this uplift was uh, our very own first black president, uh, mm. who you know would go um, to different uh, communities now he would go you know so what was what was irksome if you will uh was this idea that he would go basically um he would go to the white community uh or uh, a white population or basically go not really to to talk to bankers and it would be about policy but when he came to talk to black people what did he talk about he talked about us being better parents he talked about you know uh making sure that we got our kids in the house uh, fed them better, didn't watch too much TV, it was all these really sort of underclass assumptions about, you know, about black poor people and, and, and working class uh, uh, people um, that he was, that he was uh, uh, projecting. And that's been a basic part of the program. And so, so I think a large part of, uh, you know, that agenda, um, you know, if you were, if, if you're, um, if your program is dependent on individuals qualifying uh, to get access to um, social goods, which they should get access to as citizens and as residents, if you're dependent on that, then you must have a program that basically uh, engages in behavior modification, right? And, and, and we saw so much of that. In fact, you know, what I say in the book is that a large part of the interest in public housing in the beginning uh, was was the idea that public housing would would shape um, these these folks into good tenants, right? Good homemakers, right? They couldn't have been before that, but through that process, and then that would that would prepare them for home ownership. So it was this idea of sort of a, a ladder starting out, you know, in public housing moving up. And again, it was you know black social workers who often were the managers of, of public housing uh, at that particular time, and so you know. And so there was a lot of attention to them making themselves palatable uh, to, um, you know, to their future um, future white neighbors, but also uh, making them palatable to their their uh, uh, future black middle class neighbors, right? Uh, so yeah, where's your uplift has been a, a, a continuing program uh, amongst this elite. One of the one question I want to ask is this is very important because. You know, we, we have been promoting this, this episode to talk about how black middle class or black professional class or black elite complicity helped facilitate 
uh, bad housing uh, decisions or even housing segregation for working class blacks in post-war Chicago. So if you can specifically, can you elaborate for us the specific ways in which, whether you want to call them the black middle class or the black elite, in the post-World War II era, facilitated lower housing quality for poor and working class Blacks in Chicago? Yeah, uh, I can. I mean, first thing I would say is that, um, you know, Black middle class at that particular time um, felt their own constraints, right? They were constrained by uh, their own, they, they all lived basically in the more affluent parts of the ghetto. Right, so they were they were victims of a racial uh, uh, residential segregation, um, and they were you know and and they and, and so they had to they thought they had to find ways of making money, um, and many of those ways were uh, exploiting their their brothers and sisters. So one of the major areas um, that you see um, black wealth at that particular point is in real estate. So you have uh, somebody like Oscar Dupreece, um, who's the first um, black congressman since the Reconstruction, was elected in 1928. You have Carl Hansberry, the father of Lorraine Hansberry, uh, who his other daughter called him the father of kitchenettes. And the kitchenettes were subdivided apartments, one room apartments without kitchens, without bathrooms that were in deplorable condition. Um, you had Jesse Bingham. They were all made their money from, from real estate. So that's that's a basis, right? That's a basis in terms of uh, there's always been a sort of, uh, a, not ascendant, but a, uh, a, um, a part of that, of that class that has wanted to use uh, and make money and to gain uh, profits um, from, in the real estate uh, era. When it comes to policymakers, what you find, though, um, mostly, you know, mostly the 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 push for black home ownership after World War II, um, and you know, and again, there, you know, on its own, it looks like it's some. It was certainly necessary. There wasn't the attention to the uh, sort of black housing market that they had hoped for, um, but that push took the uh, attention, uh, policy attention, the political attention away from public housing, away from the kinds of uh, really sort of uh, uh, extension of public housing that would, would have addressed the housing needs of a larger group uh, of, of working class folk, right? So it was more by omission, right? Um, in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, not and priorities. The priorities were let's tend to our most immediate constituency, and that is getting access to uh, home ownership. Uh, and that meant our political capital and our attention went to that uh, and not to continually to push for a broader public housing program. Now, I know that the overall field was hostile, both in terms of Congress and also uh, in terms of the real estate industry. But if that's the solution that's going to address yeah, you know, uh, the, the better housing needs of, of the population, uh, then that's what you have to continue to work with and think about different ways of pushing that. So I think the, the major way, the, the major failing uh, when it comes to policy was that choice, was, you know, was buying into, in a sense, sort of the American dream and the importance of home ownership. And it's come back now. It's come back now on the guise of let's reduce the, the black rate, you know, the racial wealth gap. That becomes the rationale for us now focusing on home ownership once again, and not thinking about a broad social housing program, which in, in increases rent subsidies uh, to a larger group of people who would have access to adequate and affordable housing, right? Not everybody's going to own their own home, right? And so what you want to focus, if you're, going to, if you're going to impact on the largest group of people, you need to think about how can I, um, you know, push for and win, right, more subsidies so that it's not the, the very poor who have access to public housing, but people who have to get up and go to work every day, right? And so we see the same kind of, uh, I think, if you, if you will, sort of omission 
and, and priorities uh, now that we saw then. Interesting, interesting. So what, what ends up happening is that the, the fallacy of this racial kinship unified black interest doesn't calculate the class prerogatives of those who are the leader of the community and whether maliciously or not, they intentionally look out for their own class interests. And as a consequence, the majority of black folk who are working class get left behind. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the, it is, it's interesting. So, I mean, some, in some cases, their class interests are quite clear, right? If you look at, you know, different studies of black gentrification, you'll be those who are talking about, look, I'm here um, to see my property um, develop, right? See my property uh, values increase um, and really don't care who's displaced, right? I mean, that's a, that's a sort of naked, if you will, class interest. But for the most part, or at least in, uh, at least in other circumstances, that class interest gets folded into the racist interest. Right, and so in some cases, the the I, I think, or you know, that perhaps the class interests are not even uh, visible to those who are continually to spout ideas of racial unity, ideas of racial group politics. Um, so you know, it, but it but it's there, uh, and it comes back, um, and you know, and in some cases that you know when you when you go far enough, actually. Um, and thinking about uh, the impact and the lack of impact of, of race first programs, race targeted programs, uh, and the fact that who gets fed first are black middle class folks, um, then you're talking about that race politics being a class politics. Right, okay. Uh Another question I want to ask you is that many scholars of Jim Crow housing discrimination focus on the role of white financial institutions, majority white uh, government officials. Some would even deny that black elites had enough power to adversely affect the housing options of working class and poor blacks. Can you explain why it's important to complicate the narrative of ex exclusive white responsibility for providing a rebuttal didn't have the power to affect black working class and policy. Can you can you ask that question again, Pascal? The uh boost mobile on your Wi-Fi was acting up. I said my my the last part of the question was that uh can you explain why it's important to complicate mm -hmm. the narrative of exclusive white responsibility of urban housing discrimination while providing rebuttal to the argument that black elites didn't have the power to affect black working class and poor housing. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that that, that clearly is the, so the, the, the major perspective on looking at this particular time period. And I think that um, in the, during this time period, um, no question that the architects uh, of, of, you know, both class stratified and racially discriminatory housing policy uh, were, uh, financial elites uh, was the um, uh, the retailers, uh, people who own property, large property in the downtown area, and their allies, if you were their partners that were in City Hall. Uh, and these were, you know, for the most part, white men. Um, so we understand that. But if you don't, um, if you don't criticize, you know, if you don't, if you will, the sort of public-private partnership that was pushing things like urban renewal, uh, if you don't criticize it for beyond its racially discriminatory aspects of it, um, and basically arguing, in a sense, uh, what we saw, I think, in Chicago is that what we need actually is Black-led redevelopment, right? We need um, uh, Blacks to be in charge or to be at least partners in that. If you're if you're engaging in that, then you're then you're complicit. Then then you're legitimizing that particular arrangement, right? And so you may not have had the power to do it, but you're you're not talking about you're not exposing the political ec uh, economic foundations of that arrangement. Um, and what that sets up, and what I what what I think is you know what it set up is that at the present time, um, the folks who didn't have power to to do much about it in the 1950s and 60s, 
have now been incorporated uh, in these public and private partnerships in any number of cities, Atlanta, New Orleans, Philadelphia, uh, for a time in Chicago. Um, and they are part of the architects now, right? They are part of the people who are making these policies. Um, so you can make the argument that they didn't have the power, um, you know, in, at that particular time. And that was a power to, to make sure, you know, that these policies uh, would, would, you know, be enacted. Um, but um, they certainly didn't, didn't fight it in the ways in which to expose its broad implications uh, for, you know, for how it was constructed and its broad implications in terms of its impact, right? Uh, and, not, and by not doing that and also seeking to be incorporated and to be part, as you will, at the table, right? Um, that in fact legitimizes those particular arrangements, which are particularly, particularly pernicious uh, in this neoliberal era. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Uh, one of the most important lessons of your book for today's politics is the way in which Black elite preference for racial democracy or race-specific policy results in a policy prescription that disproportionately benefits that same class or the Black elites, with the Black working class and Black poor largely getting left behind. Since 2016 and the rise of Bernie Sanders, we've seen large numbers of Americans push for some form of social democracy or class-based remedies as a response to the contemporary economic precarity. It is noticeable that the corporate black media elite and some of the black political class intentionally tried to paint Sanders and this type of politics as being racially tone, tone deaf or class reductionist. Are we seeing a replication of the same problems that existed during the post-World War II period where black elites used racial unity to protect their class interests to the detriment of the majority of blacks who are working class? Well, we're definitely seeing, uh, uh, you know, the projection of, of, of racial unity um, and that racial unity excluding, um, you know, class-based policies. But I would say it's, it's uh, you know, I don't know if it's been this bold, actually, or this, this, this sort of attack on Bernie Sanders and particularly the universal uh, programs, uh, you know, uh, whether it was uh, John Lewis talking about, um, you know, um, nothing, you know, when it comes to uh, free higher, public higher education, nothing is free. Um, you know, and so when you be begin to see that kind of attack, um, when you begin to see race and um, being used as a, a as a weapon against social democratic programs, then I think you know. Then I think we are are in a um, um, in, in in sort of dangerous times, right? I think we're in dangerous times, and because I think it's become now a litmus test that you have to speak to um, to racism, whether it's called structural racism or racial discrimination, that becomes a litmus test be before you can be considered, um, you know, uh, uh, um, to run for office, I suppose, but, you know, to, have, to be able to even comment and talk about what are the kinds of problems that are facing, um, you know, facing the Black community. And so, Absolutely, I think that um, I don't see it so much as a replication. The black, the racial unity existed in the past and it exists now, um, but I but I see that you know I think there was a little more fluidity uh, around um, racial democracy and social democracy. Certainly, going up into the war, um, and we begin to see racial democracy become more dominant after war. Right now, though, I think that. Um, there's no question that that race has been used, um, you know, against social de democratic programs. In other words, if you can't speak to, uh, you know, uh, or ha or have a policy that's going to speak and address and, and target uh, African Americans, um, then it becomes delegitimate. Even though we know that if Medicare for all. Uh, or free public higher education was implemented, the majority of black people would benefit, right? But it becomes a sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of race targeted program, which by the way, uh, are very similar to means tested programs 
in the sense that they are very narrowly uh, focused. Um, and because of their narrow uh, focus uh, and narrow uh, remedies, um, they don't have the political power to be implemented. And if they are implemented, the political power to be sustained. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're you know, uh, it is, um, uh, per, you know, we're in precarious times when we see this, the kinds of attack that we saw, um, you know, during the, the Sanders uh, campaign and the use of race um, to beat down, if you will, uh, a social democratic programs that would benefit the majority of black people. I can't say that uh, um, too many times. Wow. So one of the things that we talk about on this show is how black politics is a class politics and the class it represents is not the majority of blacks who are working class. What is fascinating about your book is that you illustrate that this is not merely a contemporary phenomenon, but goes back well early into the 20th century. Do you see the current moment of the Great Awakening, the post-George Floyd focus on racial grievance and racism as a moment once again where the material interests of most Blacks will be obfuscated by the race-based remedies that benefit the Black elite? And you can talk about reparations as well as part of that. The whole kind of contemporary era where racial grievance is the discourse of the day. Yeah, I mean, I think my last uh, response spoke to that, right? I think, you know, spoke to, again, to reiterate that um, race-based programs have the same kind of weakness of, as means-tested programs. So let me say, there's a reason why conservatives and business activists, uh, whenever, you know, usually they don't want to do anything in terms of social welfare, but when they are pushed to do it, um, and we saw this also with the, with the relief bill in terms of trying to bring down, you know, uh, uh, the number of, uh, of the, you know, the sort of income of people who get access to the checks, right? Um, so their whole point is to sort of make sure that fewer people get, uh, fewer people benefit from any kind of social welfare or universal program. Um, and if there's, 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 if there's fewer people, then that allows for a certain political weakness. And that political weakness, um, you know, comes comes. The political weakness doesn't allow for as kind of a sustained uh, that you know it won't it won't bring the kinds of policies and goods that are necessary, right? So you know, so only a universal program with strong anti discrimination regulations, only that kind of program can speak to those particular needs. And yet, yes, I mean, you know. Um, the class politics has changed um, in terms of its orientation, in terms of its focus, in terms of its discourse, but that class politics has always been there. And we're seeing it now, um, you know, in, in particular, in the ways in which we, the ways in which uh, uh, I think uh, Cedric Johnson talks about black exceptionalism, the ways in which we have forwarded African-Americans and their plight uh, beyond any other uh, working class people and, you know, for sure, and under a rape, rapacious capitalism, um, there has been many victims, and black people, poor black people, have been part of it. Uh, but to to play that game where we're the worst victims, and therefore we should be, you know, our need should be targeted first, and to even explain that through that targeting, other people are going to benefit. I think um, uh, is a mis you know, is is, a, is has been a dead end, and will be a dead end politically. Um, and so it won't have the kind of support, you won't be able to gain the kind of support for the programs, which is very difficult, you know, in this particular, in this environment, very difficult to achieve. You won't have that uh, with that particular focus. So there needs to be a sort of, uh, if you will, at least in my view, um, you know, uh, a social democratic focus uh, on um, in, in informing black politics at this particular time. Jason, you was that was that quite, was that answer good enough for you this time around, Pascal? I, I like all of the answers were good for me. I mean, I... we've got we've gotten a lot of good uh, comments from this show. Uh, it it is a little later where where Professor Smith is right now. He's he's on the East Coast, so 
if I haven't said it already, I truly, truly appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us. I know it's a little later this e- in, the, in the evening. Uh, usually people do these shows a little earlier, but I am on the West Coast and I control everything. So <laughs> there you go. Is there any questions from the chat before we before uh, the professor signs off? Oh, people are saying you're fantastic, professor. Oh, that was I good. Put, oh, yeah. Well, I want to brought yeah, yeah. that you talk. What are your thoughts? And give it if you can give us an analysis of the current uh, fascination with racial disparities discourse and the racial wealth gap, and what exactly does that politics? sets up is it a new politics is it a new discourse and what do you think it's about well i think the focus on uh you know racial disparities is is um what i've been trying you know what i've been talking about is you know so again so much i think of what uh informs um uh the class politics of the of this particular group uh, is this idea uh that um in a sense, class hierarchy should not ever be attacked or or, 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 or destructed, right? Class hierarchy, what we want, or what this group particular wants with the idea of racial disparities, is they want proportional representation um, uh, in terms of race. They want the same number or same proportion of, of black uh, rich people to have access that you know white rich people have. And you know, and so what does that, that do? Is that, I mean, how does that help, uh, you know, both working class black people and working class white people, or working class brown people, for that matter? Um, so racial disparities, I think, ha- is is a um, it's, it's, so it's it's a really myopic way of thinking about um, uh, the kinds of issues that are facing um, uh, poor poor and working class black people. Um, it doesn't, you know, it it, it assumes a, a kind of trickle down. Basically, you help. The elites, or you help their institutions like black private colleges, like my alma mater, and then that's going to trickle down um, to um, you know, uh, you know, you know, to folks at the bottom. And so I think that that it's it's been a fascination because that fascination allows for class and class hierarchy to be um, to be hidden and not to be attacked and not to be exposed as being part of the problem. Um, you know, um, you, you, you know, our our goal here, our goal here, if you want to, um, you know, you want to improve the lives of, of the people who have to get up and go to work every day, then you have to talk about, you know, class inequality. You have to talk about broad economic inequality. And that's what the battle here is for, right? The battle is trying to change the focus, uh, change our focus on that, because that's going to have uh, you know, more of an impact on the people who need things the most, uh, rather than um, uh, sort of, you know, ill-considered reparation schemes that are not going to go anywhere in the first place, right? They're not going to go, they're not going to be legislated uh, by Congress. Um, so why are we, uh, you know, why are we trying to uh, put our political capital in that? rather than focusing on what is going to have the broadest impact and what's going to be to have the best uh, stability and longevity, right? Not, to, not that you have to, you, will, you still have to fight uh, for these things and continue to fight and continue to be vigilant, but what's gonna have the longevity, but access uh, to quality public goods, access to public uh, quality public goods. Uh, and that, you know, whether it's public education, uh, health care, uh, housing, um, and being able to work for a livable wage. These are the things that, you know, that, uh, as many people would say, that is the Black agenda, or that should be the Black agenda. So I don't know if you saw this, Pascal, the OG. <clears throat> uh, Janice Graham asked, ask him about his thoughts on the affirmatively furthering fair housing guidance, please, and thank you. Sure. Um, you know, I um, I think any sort of regulations that are attacking, um, you know, and looking at uh, uh, re- residential segregation is good, you know, I, I, I'm important. Um, it's been a problem um, for a long time and it's been a naughty problem, right? Other 
uh, you know, other public accommodations and other have been easier to attend res, uh, residential segregation has been difficult. <clears throat> but again, I don't think we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to solve that problem um, by something like, um, you know, um, fair housing. And, and I mean, we certainly need better enforcement, uh, more enforcement. Um, but I think the problem is is really the nexus between race and property values. Um, mm. and unless we attack that nexus, right? And you can't attack that nexus through uh, anti-racism uh, uh, workshops. You got to attack that nexus by making property values uh, have uh, less of an impact on people's access to good housing, right? If we, as long as we continue to depend on uh, whether our, you know, our, 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 our wealth, or our welfare is dependent on whether your, ha your housing, the, whether the property values are increasing, as long as we depend on that, then, you know, we're going to lose. And the most people are going to lose and they're not going to have access to uh, those social goods. So we have to begin to, and I said this earlier, decommodify housing and make property values less mm -hmm. important and not um, have them mm -hmm. not have our access to education, access to, um, you know, quality of life dependent on those property values. That to me is where we need to, to focus on. We need to break and that. That actually uh, brings up, and uh, if you don't want to stay for this, I understand you've been on here for, we, we got, we got the hour. I'm very excited. We got the hour. Out here. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I found out, i watched a, a short documentary on uh, Chavez Ravine and mm -hmm. I, I knew a little bit of the history of Chavez Ravine, that it was a, a, a predominantly Latin neighborhood in Los Angeles that was leveled for the ballpark. But I did not know that initially it was going to be the site of a very, very large, it would have been the largest in the country at the time had it been built public housing project that would have allowed the Latin residents and of course white residents and, and, and black residents to stay in this, in this racially mixed uh, housing project in California. I think they said they had like $110 uh, million mm. uh, housing project that they were gonna build there and they mm. had the plans for it, it was all ready to go. And the LA Times pushed back against it very hard because they were very pro home ownership and anti-communist because they were in bed with developers. I, I believe the, the owners knew some developers. Uh, those developers, if you're a sports fan, uh, was the O'Malley uh, family that mm -hmm. owns the uh, Dodgers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a uh, big reason why they wanted to move because they, they uh, the city had went and didn't even do it through eminent domain. I guess there was a, a something in the, in the, so basically these houses that people built there, many of them were substandard, right? right. Because right. Latin people are also uh, yeah. marked out of the housing uh, market as well. So sure. Sure. there's no city infrastructure, a lot of farmland. So as you have this, this group of people coming up from, from rural uh, Mexico, and then they have all this open farmland, they used it to, to live on, the infant mortality rate was pretty high because they didn't have access to hospitals. Mm -hmm. So th these were all the things that the city was going to build. They were going to build hospitals. They were going to build schools, adequate housing, parks, and infrastructure. Um, all this gets kiboshed under the guise of this is a communist project. Yeah. You can't have communism. Uh, it would have been the lousy, the, lousy the, the largest housing project at the time in the country. Um, and then we get uh, Dodger Stadium a, a few uh, a few years later. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I actually found something out about that. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't I don't know the particular case um, that you're referring to, but but the kinds of decisions that were made in this regards was replicated in every city in the country. I mean, you know, uh, whenever there was a possibility for um, you know solid good public housing. When public housing was first developed in the 30s and the 40s, that public housing was far better than what people were living in. I mentioned kitchenettes, mm -hmm. wooden mm -hmm. tenements that were, uh, you know, uh, uh, liable to catch on fire at any, any, any moments, right, and put people in peril. 
you know, uh, modern fixtures, right? So public housing was was good. And and the idea is, I mean, the reason why I went bad is because often it was starved for funds uh, mm-hmm. from Congress and then also, um, especially places like Chicago, you know, it was managed by patronage hires of the Chicago machine. So, you know, it was not done in, in basically in the, in the, in the favor of, of the tenants themselves. But the whole idea of schools and, you know, really sort of building community for the residents themselves, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an old social democratic idea. I mean, that's an idea that basically that's who government, that's who government should serve. Mm-hmm. Uh, so absolutely, newspapers, and I'm not surprised about the LA Times, all the major newspapers were part of that growth machine. Uh, the work with developers that, that pushed the idea that this was best for the city, whether it was Dodger Stadium or Convention Center or you oh. know, Affluent House, right? I mean, they, they, or Affluent, they, yeah. yeah. Housing, right? Anything but, you know, housing for uh, the citizens themselves. Uh, and not only that, but, you know, but things like uh, uh, good schools and, you know, and hospitals and other kinds of social goods in, in the vicinity. So, yeah, I'm not surprised. I don't know the, the the particular case, but I'm not surprised that decision was made. It was made uh, in every city uh, in in the country at that time, and continues to be made at this time. Yes, and and it's and it's you know we we look at public housing, I think, almost punitively, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is where, where poor people live, so yeah. let's not make it that nice because we want people to aspire. And what I found very interesting, and it really just echoes your sentiment right there, that this was going to be housing that was going to be so much better. These people, literal outhouses, most of the houses, yeah. think of about 3,000 people that lived there, right, yeah. at, at this time. And the city comes in, and, and it's not eminent domain like everybody thought. They actually bought the property. They said market value, mm-hmm. but there's a lot that goes into whatever market value is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes people of color had to pay more for, for a piece of property than their white counterpart. There definitely was a lot of, you know, covenants to keep even brown people out of neighborhoods. Sure. So even though these people sold these you know, ramshackle homes for, uh, I think, I think one guy says in this documentary, his dad sold his property for $9,000 and, you know, let's keep in mind, this is in the forties. So mm-hmm. you know, it's a jet mm-hmm. for inflation if you really want to. And could not find a home yeah less than fifteen thousand dollars that's right and these are and these are multi-generational families as well yeah so you're talking about multiple people and, and you know you talk about this too in, in in your writing about how so many people live in one room yeah. so now they can't even go do that when they try to go live in the city uh so it's it's a very sad story. Uh, the only story I knew, honestly, was about the people that were left over from this. So when the city initially came in to buy the property to build the housing for people, they were telling people, like, look, we're going to build beautiful uh, public housing for you with schools and roads and everything. And we want to buy your property, yada, yada, yada. Everybody was happy. A few people wanted to stay, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That whole thing gets kiboshed over literally calling the architect a communist. The architect then being called to Congress. And when asked, are you a communist? He says, I don't believe that's a constitutional question. (laughs) And I'm not going to answer it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're like, fine, you're a communist. The propaganda machine gets running. It's the L.A. Times in the 40s. Right. Right. You right. can only imagine what that must be like. Yeah, um, that's like if everyone retweeted it. So, <laughs> for the people that don't know, so I mean, a, big, program. A, a large part of the the reason why I mean, there were people like Catherine Bauer, uh, who mm-hmm. was part of the labor how helped to start the labor housing conference in the 1930s. Um, her idea was to make um, you know, public housing um, available to a broad working class, right? Um, and it's also she was against any kind of a renewal as giveaways to private developers, which which is what they are. The you know the land gets condemned, um, and so that land you know the demolition is public dollars. The the they buy the uh, you know they buy the land at a discount or get it conveyed to them, right? So this is basically you know we're using public 
assets uh, and given them to uh, private uh, private entities, private corporations, private developers for their own profit, supposedly for a public purpose. But that public purpose we just talked about is, you know, basically leisure or or, or housing <laughs> or you know, or commercial for uh, a middle class, right? And or for or in some cases the elite, elites. Um, so you know, so it, 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 you know. The attack on public housing did call it uh, socialistic, did call it communistic, uh, and that was a large part of of sort of stopping that, um, you know, that reform effort coming out of the 1930s. And you know, we don't see the kind of broad, you know. So it's not just, you know, I criticize, uh, you know, civic elites, black civic elites, but you know, we see other sectors, liberals, and we see, you know, labor unions also not. Uh, supporting public housing, uh, and that large part of that is because they had access to private housing. So um, it's a it's a shame. It was a missed opportunity, and and right now, you know, as you mentioned, the, even the term public housing is toxic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. you know, and but I think the proper way of thinking about this is social housing, uh, and thinking about mm -hmm. this is you know uh, housing that's going to. to uh, that, that basically is, is, is socialized in, in terms of its cost, you know, and, and the benefits should be the broad public. Um, you know, so I think that's what we, we need to think about housing um, in, a, in, a, in a different way. And I think social housing is the direction we need to think. To. Oh, it's, it, it, there's, a, there's a socialist architect, and I cannot remember his name, and maybe you or Pascal remember the gentleman's name, who built a housing uh, uh, it wasn't public housing. It was like a housing development in, in Southern California. And I cannot remember the name of the development off the top of my head. And part of the, the what he built was it was just the utility of the house was made so the walls can move to fit your needs. <laughs> so if you needed three rooms, you could move the walls and have three rooms. If you wanted a bigger living room, you can move it. And, and it's it was the antithesis of the Levittown houses, which which weren't which weren't built. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it I, I wish I remember the name of, of that uh, architect, uh, Mike the, Mike Davis uh, talks about him in his book mm. uh, City of Quartz, mm. and there's definitely a documentary about that. But again, we went longer than an hour. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Smith, for for spending some time with us. Professor Smith, and shout out his book again, Jason. Oh, guys, a long title. I just wrote it down. <laughs> In the Black Metropolis, Housing Policy in Post-War Chicago, Preston Smith, H. Smith II. And Thank there's you. links. Everybody, there's links. Wherever you're watching the show, I put links in the chat to, to the book. Hey, I appreciate Wait. the conversation. I really enjoy hey, it. We appreciate it. Hopefully you can come back. Uh, we plan on having uh, Adolph and Ture. Uh, and and Cedric on, so hopefully we can come back for like a big old giant uh, black show. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, the conversation was rich, so I I, I would love to uh, engage again. So just let me know. Oh, thank you for coming on, Professor. Smith. All right, have a good one. All right, you brothers, take care. Peace. Hey, peace. Right on, right on. I'm not going to lie, y'all. Uh, Professor Smith is a serious cat. He's not really for the bullshit. So I was a little nervous. I was like, this man is serious. His email responses is all serious. I, I asked Teray today. I was like, does this brother laugh? <laughs> Teray was like, yeah. <laughs> but that that's a good show. So, yeah, somebody said, damn, Adolph, Teray, Preston, Cedric. That would be bananas. It would be. You can only get it at one place, right here. This is revolution. This is a revolution. Who else is going to give you that show? Only here will you get that show. We got to give a shout out to Tore. Tore, read shout out to you if you're watching this because you put some of this stuff. If it wasn't for you, me and Pascal wouldn't be doing this. So definitely shout out to Tore and and uh. Yes, Mama, I do have a dress code, and it's button-ups on Thursday, so quit messing with me. I thought that was an excellent show. I thought uh, it was concise to the point. We got, you know, 
a lot of bases were covered, and uh, we had a lively chat. I really got. A ch- I'm glad we got a chance to uh, to talk to Professor Smith. His book and his analysis is all spot on, man. To Ray Reed is a mass. Actually, it's Cedric. Because without Cedric, there is no Ture on the show. So without Cedric, there's no Ture. Without Ture, there's no Pascal. There you go. And I don't know who who I had on to convince Cedric to come on the show. <laughs> so thank you guys. If you haven't done it already. Share the show. Please hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified. We do this every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Saturday, we have a special episode of, we don't know what to call it yet. I, we joke around and call it Tuesday on Marcus' show Black Tuesday, and Saturday is equally as colored because it's, it's Pascal, myself, and Marcus from the Left Flank Vets. We will be joined by Paul Prescott of Jacobin is going to come on. So there's going to be uh, an array of of uh, of colored black people, like the whole rainbow from Paul to I think I'm darker than Pascal. Oh, whatever, man. Carmel. <laughs> Carmel is Carmel. Man. So I want to play this. I want to play this documentary for you guys. Uh, I'm going to play a, f- a few minutes of it. I'll try to put a link up in the chat because I don't want to get the video taken down um, from playing this. I don't think the guy that uh, made this would, would would take it down, but you never know who owns the rights to stuff nowadays. But this is a very interesting documentary on uh, Chavez Ravine. If you don't know baseball, it's where the Los Angeles Dodgers play. Uh, I, I talked a little bit about it with uh, with Professor Smith. It is, uh, for me, a fascinating story about the way we view public housing still to this day. So my mom says it sounds like a box of crayons. (laughs) Oh, Pascal, side note, you did a great job today. Oh, thank you. Uh... Somebody says they're a white tech worker surrounded by liberal PMCs, but grew up working union family class. And this show resonates more with than any typical lefty podcast. Oh, well, it's wow. because I lived for a time with working class white people. And that's a whole other topic for all of this show. And yes, I am. I am talking black complexion and I am racist. And Doug Lane, by the way, Pascal said, Kill Whitey is a totally okay title for your book. He texted me earlier today. <laughs> I'm not joking. He actually hit me with that in a in a messenger today. He said, oh, yeah, tell Pascal I'm totally fine with. Uh... And he didn't say Whitey. He said, kill. And he said, blank, blank, blank. <laughs> so I was like, oh, shit, he watched it. Um, also... I'm putting things together for people that are patrons uh, so we can watch a movie together. Um, can Pascal ask a one sentence question? Oh, I thought no. Jeff was the same person who was like, Pascal asked good questions. Now I was like, can he ask a one sentence question? Really? Hell no, he can't. Joshua, quit fucking with me. <laughs> I didn't have coffee. That's why, because Pascal was messing with me. Said I can't have, I can't have coffee when I do this because it lasts too long. Shows last too long. My family's still hiding downstairs from me. So uh, I just watched the Billy Holiday movie and I wanted to watch it with you guys. We're going to be talking about coming to America too uh, on Saturday. So definitely tune in Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. M- me, Pascal, Marcus from Left Flank Vets, the usual three suspects. Joined with Paul Prescott that just got warned about what we're talking about. So he's going to go watch uh, Coming to America 2 as well. And Pascal has a very, very deep analysis that I don't even want him to preview right now because he called me up at like one o'clock in the morning, his time. To say, yo, man, did you watch Coming to America 2? I was like, yeah, brother. I just, Bro, man, we got to talk about this. 
9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Yes, it is early as fuck because I have a child and he doesn't like me to sleep. So 12, 12, p- 12 p.m. Eastern Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. The rest of the cats that are coming on are all in Eastern Time, so they will look very rested while I will have bags under my eyes. So we will be talking about that. Um if if people don't really want to watch the Billy Holiday movie, well, I'll, I'll leave it up to the patrons once they want to watch either Billy Holiday or this uh, or this Coming to America too. Um, but w- I do want to watch a movie on Patreon in the next week or so. We decided a Sunday is going to be a good day to do it. One of the homies is going to help us set it up so we can do it on on the Discord. So it'll be just for patrons. We can watch the movie and we'll take like a deep dive after the movie and critique it and talk shit with everybody. It should be a good time. I did this with Ben Burgess on his Patreon with Judas and the Black Messiah. It actually was a, a good a good time. The new Billy Holiday movie is called, I think, is it the U.S. first Billy Holiday or sure, the State Against Billy Holiday? It's uh, ah, forget what it's called, but it's a Lee Daniels movie. And every time I say Lee Daniels, it just puckers up Pascal's behind. Watch Lee Daniels. See? And there's no in this video. There's no copyright infringement material in this, right? We'll be doing it on a on a whole other thing where we won't be sharing it here. It'll just be for the patrons, so it'll be like secret shit. I'm talking about this video. We should be good. I'm not gonna play the whole thing. We should be good. I'm just saying. I know. Three dollars will get you in as a patron. Three dollars. I lowered it to three dollars. Pascal, you're a Monique supporter. Confirmed. No, says. I, don't, I don't have a problem with her, but you know, I'm not a pre- I didn't like that movie, Precious. Pascal likes her earlier work in Moesha and the Parkers. No. <laughs> Your mom was like, "You need, I need, yeah, I need an off button for real, right?" <laughs> Seriously. All right, I'm gonna stop. Pascal makes it horrible because he just sets up these jokes so perfectly. I had this dream that all those hills had been leveled. The house is torn down. I saw it in my dream. And exactly the way I saw it, that's the way it happened. It's the tragedy of my life. Absolutely. I was responsible for uprooting, I don't know how many hundreds of people from their own little valley and having a whole thing destroyed. It's sort of taken on a mythical (coughs) sense in people's memories, and then with the feeling that it was unfairly taken from them. So it's it's no wonder that that people have strong feelings about it. Uh, He said, please, your sons and a baseball team, let's go to the Dodgers as a family. I'll never go again. I hated it. I didn't enjoy it. It was like dancing on a grave. Mm. 1962, in Chavez Ravine, a few miles from downtown Los Angeles, baseball fans crowd the bleachers of the brand new Dodger Stadium to welcome their team from Brooklyn. The stadium sits on 170 acres of freshly cleared land, land that just 12 years earlier was home to over 300 families. The neighborhoods of La Loma, Palo Verde, and Bishop, the neighborhoods of Chavez Ravine. Me, myself, I loved it there. I loved it because we used to run up and down the hills, and we knew every little trail around there in the neighborhood. I don't think anybody want to move out of your neighborhood when you've been living there so long, and you know everybody like a big family. Allegiant Park was our playground. You know, the whole park was right next to it. We used to go down there and swim naked in the LA River. We used to make dams you know, with rocks, you know, make holes and then swim in that dirty water. 
We won a lot of trophies there in the Legion Park. Believe me, we did. Football, you name it, baseball, basketball. We were good. We would get to the playground, play the opponents. They would come up with their brand new uniforms, and here we look like those goddamn East Side kids, you know, raggedy ass kids playing baseball. That other team, you know, they said, how could these guys beat us? There were great times for me, beautiful times. Yeah. The processions, the lighted candle. The men would dress like Roman soldiers. They had this big drum. Boom, boom, boom. We would go through the hills. It was unbelievable when I seen all these pictures. I was really surprised. And I never seen anybody with a camera. Who would take these pictures? Nobody would go up the hill and take pictures, and nobody could afford a camera. I was just, I was looking for a, a kind of a postcard view of Los Angeles. I uh, had a friend who had a car, and uh, we drove around looking and found this hill and walked up the hill. And, uh, but then I looked down the other side of that hill I was standing on, and, and there was this community below me. It looked like a village, dirt roads and uh, houses going up the roads and, and people walking around. The hill still exists right there. You can see it up the top. Yeah. With it. So I was I was up there someplace when I took the shot. Yeah, he was up uh, uh, on uh, on uh, Pine Street, the Yolo Drive. I made photographs in '48 and most of them in 1949, and I had very little luck in uh, in showing them or getting anybody to even look at them. Fifty years later, Don found a publisher who thought his photograph should be a book. And for the first time, they were seen by the people of Chavez Ravine. Got a card table, and a couple of chairs with uh, a box full of photographs from 1949. And a crowd formed around and people were exclaiming and some burst into tears. And it, was <laughs> it was quite marvelous. It was quite grand. Oh, every time I see that book, I, I feel like crying. Like I, I could see the house where I was born. I, my daughters were born there. My daughter was born, my wife was born there. When I was a kid, I used to build model airplanes, kites, and I used to fly way on top of the hill. It was so clear. Many years back, you could see Playa del Rey, Santa Monica, and San Pedro, just the city hall was the tallest building. And it was very nice up here. To me, it was just.